What? to see everyone this evening what a beautiful spring day that we're having uh, it's great seeing uh, I had to had that song on my mind as I think about the the flowers that are blooming the grass is turning green it's just good that uh, we can see God's handiwork all around us at this time of year it's so good to be together this evening thank you all for joining us online as we come together uh, to have this period of devotional together as well as a period of Bible study thank you uh, for your presence here in the building uh, as well as online a few announcements uh, Hopefully you got your family news line a couple of things. We want to add to it uh, Just reminders that um, Sheila Chapel uh, She is actually being admitted into the hospital for bronchitis and Pneumonia uh, no visitors at this time. She is at Southern Hills, but keep her in your prayers Sue Ernest fell and broke her nose and thumb. She had surgery on her nose yesterday So let's keep her in your prayers Good news that Barbara Napier, uh, she is 
while she is in rehab right now, she does hope to go home on Friday. So let's be very prayerful for her and um, as she is recovering at home now. A few announcements as we think about what all is going on, and there is a lot going on. Uh, this Sunday, we'll remind you, it is our fifth Sunday. All excess contributions will go toward a travel fund to support our members that want to attend any of the trips to our domestic mission points with Mike this year. So please keep that in mind as you're giving on Sunday. We also have the Tennessee Children's Home, uh, the items for that that we're collecting. There are printed lists in the hallway, and you will see uh, the, the bins in the hallway where you can pick those up. April 5th is the deadline. Uh, next Wednesday night, uh, the third, is our Wednesday night fellowship meal. You can sign up in the cabinets or sign up online for that. I uh, know it will be a great treat. And then on April the 6th will be movie night for the adults and the kids. I know if I don't mention this, Mike will get up here and mention it. So, well, uh, Ben-Hur, right. So we'll get, I'm sure that will be a, a good night. So um, April 6th at 6 p.m., there will be a movie for the kids and for the adults. So keep that in mind. Um, also, there will be a fellowship dinner April the 7th uh, for the entire congregation. We hope you all will come and be a part of this fellowship meal. Uh, this has been a while since we've done one, so we're very excited about this time of fellowship together. One additional reminder before we get into our devotional, our church office will be closed on Friday uh, as well as Monday. So keep that in mind. If you have any needs, uh, the church office will be closed on Friday and Monday. So. Let's get into our devotional period. Uh, we're going to do a song, and then our brother Jerry is going to come and give us a, 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 a devotional thoughts, and we'll look forward to that, and then we'll go into our classes. Let's start off with Heavenly Sunlight. Walking in sunlight, all of my journey, walk the mountains to the trail. Jesus has set out, never forsake me, promise divine. Sing, singing his praises. 
think about that, and we hope and pray that tonight be that very time that you say, I'm ready to do what God has asked. Is it possible that you who are here as Christians this evening look at your life and think, I'm not living like I should. I'm not measuring up to the standards that God has held before me. I'm not living in such a way that others can look at my life and perhaps be influenced by my example. And maybe during this period of time, since the last time you heard the invitation, something has caused you to think about the way in which you are falling short of living the Christian life. And with that thought having been planted in your head, perhaps this evening, you're ready now to respond and to come and to ask the Lord's forgiveness and to ask your brothers and sisters in Christ to pray with you as you seek that forgiveness from God. Is it possible this evening that you as a Christian look at your life and think of the things that you could be doing but simply are not putting yourselves in that position yet? And you would be willing to come this evening and say to your brothers and sisters as you ask them to pray with you that I need more encouragement. I need better examples. I need more help. I want to make my life better. All we're saying is, no matter how many times you hear an invitation, no matter how many times we come together and offer these invitations, sometimes they might seem pretty close. If you've come on Sunday morning and you've come on Sunday evening and both times you've heard an invitation, why would you think that in that short period of time you might decide to obey this time? Well, there's no way of answering that. There's no way of answering what is going to influence you in your decision making. What is going to influence you to see your life as it really is? As a Christian or as one who is not. You are hoping and praying that something in your life or someone in your life has so motivated you to take the step that is necessary. And this evening, you would come as one who is not a Christian to say, I'm ready to start that wonderful life that God has called upon me to live. Or as a Christian, you would come this evening saying, I want the help of my brothers and sisters, and I want their prayers. And so we do invite you this evening to make that choice, to make the right choice. Don't put it off. Now's the time. Would you come as we stand and sing, please? Oh, do not let the word be hard, and
Let us go to God in prayer, please. Our Heavenly Father, we are so blessed to be here tonight to study another portion of thy holy and divine words. We ask, dear Lord, thy God, that we may overcome any obstacles that Satan has put before us. We pray, dear Lord, thy God, that we may go about doing thy business. We ask that we may be a beacon of light to those that are in darkness. We pray, dear Lord, thy God, that we may have an open mind and an open heart. So doors may be open to us, Father, that we may go out and teach others that the way of the cross lead to a sweet and everlasting home. Forgive us, Father, of our sins and our shortcomings, realizing that we do fall short of our glory. And we always want to thank you, Father, for sending your Son down to this sin-cursed world to die for all mankind. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. Um, just going to go ahead and tell you guys that tonight we're going to be pretty scripture heavy. I haven't really done a lot of that since I've been doing this, but um, tonight I think we need to do that to kind of dig in. We're going to talk about John the Baptist tonight. And uh, to begin with, I'm just going to give you a few facts about John in general. So his actual name was John. That was commanded by the angel that appealed, appeared to Zechariah. Um, the Baptist or baptizer was given to him later on based on the work that he was doing because people recognized him as someone who baptized people with water. Um, the name John actually means God is gracious, and we'll get into a little bit more detail about that here in a little bit. Um, both of John's parents were from the tribe of Levi, were descended from Aaron. They were, uh, that means that John was a Levite and was in the priestly line of Aaron. 
Um, we don't know a whole lot about John's growing up other than what we read in Luke chapter 1, verse 80. that just says, as the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. Um, so it's unknown whether or not John was consecrated by the Lord in the very beginning or took on a Nazarite vow or anything along those lines. Um, we don't know when he moved to the desert or how that wound up happening. The scripture doesn't tell us that. We don't know if that was done early on or if it was later on in life when he moved to the, to the wilderness. Um, in any case, he stayed in the desert of the wilderness up until he began his public ministry. So he lived during the same time as Jesus. Um, he was six months older than Jesus. And during this time, Judea was a province of Rome. The Romans governed the area um, and had soldiers placed there, but the Jewish leadership was allowed to continue their sacrificing as well as handling local matters. Um, his parents at the time of his birth were older. Uh, the Bible does tell us that they were advanced in age and Elizabeth was barren. Um, so we do know that. Now, one thing culturally about that time is that people tended to have children and a lot of them. Um, Elizabeth wasn't able to do that. So we'll talk more about that too as we look at the scripture. So what I wanna do is start with Luke chapter one. And we're gonna jump around a good bit um, just because I like some of Luke's account and some of Matthew's account, and we're gonna to touch a little bit in John. So I'm gonna pick up in, in verse five. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. So it was that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, according to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went to the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the time of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither, drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before, them, before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedience, disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute, and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zechariah, and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. So I want to look at some notes, um, kind of some things we want to point out here about John's birth. So... Going back again, Zechariah was a priest, and there were a lot of people that were, were drawn there um, to determine who was going to go into the holy place. Lots were cast. It fell onto him. I think that this was probably, um, you know, God stepping in there to make sure that Zechariah could go into the temple so that Gabriel could come to him and give him this news about he was going to have a son. Um, both his parents were described in the scripture I just read as being very righteous, that they walked and followed all the commandments, and they were blameless. Um, so it wasn't because of their sin they couldn't have a child. Now, one thing that was common for the people to believe back then is if you were not able to have children, a lot of times that may be God punishing you. Uh, that was not their case. They just were unfortunate and not able to have children. And I think that that played into this as well because once she's told that she's going to have, or once Zechariah is told that they're going to have a child, um, the fact that she is older and has been barren is, is another reason that God can use to kind of show that John is an important person. So um, Zechariah, one other thing, when Gabriel came, he was fearful. 
Uh, that's commonplace in the Bible. You read that a lot that when an angel comes to talk to people that they are afraid. It says they're afraid. Usually the angel starts off with, do not be afraid. That happened here. Uh, one thing about that, and, and this is kind of a point I want to make because as a kid, I always looked at angels as being like those, those uh, precious moments figurines, you know, that have the little childlike face and stuff. And I think that's the way we always kind of envision angels or, or maybe from cartoons where we saw angels in those. They're usually, you know, baby, childlike, round face, wings. Uh, that wasn't the case. Angels were very powerful and people that when they were in the presence of an angel knew it and they knew that the angel was powerful and it was sent from God. Um, that's the reason that a lot of the people, when you read that they encountered an angel, were afraid to begin with. Um, so he was fearful when Gabriel came. Now, another interesting thing is John was chosen by God to be his name. And typically back in those days, the child, and I think, and it's not in, in Luke, but there is mention, I believe it's in Matthew, where they talk about, um, or the scripture says that they ask Zechariah at, John's birth, um, what his name will be, and of course he can't talk, so he writes down the name John, and then he's able to speak, and we'll get more to that here in a little bit, but um, the interesting thing about that is that during those times, a lot of times the child was named either after the father or named after someone in their lineage that had some sort of importance to the family. That wasn't the case here because God told Zechariah what John's name would be. So... Um, and it says that John would be filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb or from the womb. Uh, that's another indication that John was chosen by God to have a special ministry, specifically to fit that role to set up the, the coming of the Messiah and to begin the preaching, getting ready for Jesus to come. Um, Zechariah didn't believe, so Gabriel didn't really... Uh, appreciate that too much and he made sure that Zechariah couldn't speak again up until the time that John was born. Um, I think there's an interesting thing here because you'll see the, the questioning of things throughout the Bible and I think God understands the difference between a lack of faith and someone out of curiosity trying to find out more. In this situation Gabriel plainly tells Zechariah because he didn't believe then he was going to be struck mute uh, I think this is one of those situations where he just did not have the faith that God was going to do what the angel said he was going to do, and that's why that happened to him. Um, and then Elizabeth, I want to touch base on this too, because it, it, as we read through the scripture, Elizabeth prayed to God when her prayer was answered after she hid for five months and, and was pregnant. Um, and I think that goes back where she says... Uh, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Going back to what I said earlier, where at that time people had children and a lot of children, she wasn't able to, so in, in a lot of people's eyes she was looked down upon because of that. Here she's praying to God and, and she is thankful that she was able to get conceive. So one thing that I want to kind of take away from that, and Elizabeth, once she finds out this happens, she goes back and she thanks God for answering that prayer. They had prayed long, a long time to have a child, and that had never happened up until this point. So when that did happen, Elizabeth immediately thanked God for the fact that she was able to conceive. Um, I think that's an important thing that we can take away from it because there's a lot of times that we pray for things, and we may pray over and over and over again, and when God answers those prayers, we need to always remember to go back and thank God for what he did for us, for answering that prayer. Sometimes I think... We concentrate so much on praying for what we want to get, and we don't think about that thankfulness afterward. Um, so moving on, we have there in, in Luke 1, of course, Mary is told that she's going to be having Jesus. She goes to visit Elizabeth, and when she goes to visit Elizabeth, the baby leaped in her womb for joy. The Bible does say that uh, the Holy Spirit was, was, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she understood that moment in time that Mary was carrying Christ and that that was a very important thing. And, and she knew then that her child also was going to have a very specific role to play. So um, going back to John, kind of what his, his training would have been had he stayed in his family because he was the son of a priest, he was in that priestly line. That's probably what he would have wound up doing. However, because he was a prophet, 
that meant he didn't follow that path and his actual occupation was a prophet. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how John looked. Um, in Mark 1, 6, we kind of get an idea of John's lifestyle. It says that John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. So just from that description, we got to figure that he probably lived a very secluded and probably a rough life. He didn't have a lot of conveniences, didn't have a, a place that was like what many of us go to, you know, a nice home with a bed. Um, John lived a very, very meager lifestyle, uh, and he lived off of the, the locusts and wild honey. Now, um, of course, not every believer is required to live that way. Uh, in a lot of ways, John the Baptist lived a lot like Elijah did. Um, kind of getting rid of that luxurious living and, and things such as that so that you can practice more self-control and discipline and really focus on, on what your work is going to be for God. So one other little interesting fact, um, the locusts at that time were considered very nutritious. They consisted of about 60% protein compared to about 20% protein that we have in chicken and beef today. So I'm sure all of you are going to run out tonight and get you some locusts so that way you can uh, get that protein in. Um, I will say, I kind of have a little little story I want to share about that. Not that I've ever eaten bugs, but um, when we lived in Chattanooga, we had a, an issue with a hornet's nest, and it was on one of our awnings on top of our porch, and I had to climb up there to, to spray it. And uh, I told my wife, I said, well, if they come after me and I come down the ladder, spray behind me to make sure that you kill anything that's chasing me. Um, that did not go as well as planned. Once I got up there and I sprayed the hornet's nest and they did start coming out, I go down the ladder, and this is a 13 and a half foot step ladder that I've got, and uh, coming down the ladder and she starts spraying and she turns like this and hits me right in the mouth. So I can say I have never eaten bugs, but I've had bug poison in my mouth and that is not pleasant. Okay, so just wanted to share that with you uh, before I get back into the lesson here. So let's go back to John's place in history. He had the privilege to baptize Jesus. Um, that's in John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. It's the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave his testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify this is God's chosen one. So John testified that Jesus was the Son of God. Um, and again in John chapter 5, verses 31 through 34, John kind of, Jesus cites John's testimony as one that witnessed this. Uh, under Jewish law, it was important for men to have two to three witnesses to kind of confirm that what they were saying was true for man's sake, not for God's sake. So it was helpful that John testified that Jesus was true. It helped in Jesus's ministry as he was beginning out. Um, so we're going to go, I think it's going to be, we're going to be in Luke chapter three now. And I'm going to jump over there. So I'll begin in verse one, we'll read one through six. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Aturia, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene. While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of Isaiah, um, the prophet saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So this is an important scripture here because it's from Isaiah. It's foretelling the coming of, of John, who's going to prepare the way for the Christ. Um, John was the forerunner to the Messiah. He was the voice crying in the wilderness. And when asked, because there's several times in the, in the scripture, or at least a couple of times, in the different books that he's asked if he was the Christ and he made sure to respond by quoting part of this verse. Um, that was important because he did not want to be 
considered the Messiah. He knew what his job was, and he did not take that lightly. Um, Jesus had a high respect for John. In Luke chapter 7, verse 28, it says, I tell you, and this is Jesus talking, I tell you among those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. So this is Christ saying that John the Baptist is, is a very honored prophet. Um, now, at the end of that, when he ends that, the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he, that is not a slight against John. What he's indicating here is that it's important as Christians that we realize that we have a very high value and a position in God's sight. That's the point that Jesus is trying to make here is that, yes, John was great, but everyone who follows God is greater than he. Not a slight to John, but just the fact that God views us in a specific way and looks at us as, as being his children. Um, so John was a very straightforward speaker. Uh, there are a couple of times, I think this is, the account is also in Luke, but it's also in Matthew. Matthew's a little clearer as far as what it says when he refers to, I think in John it, or in Luke, it says the multitude is there and he's talking to him and he says, now he refers to them as a brood of vipers. Matthew makes it a little more clear that he has Pharisees and Sadducees coming to be baptized, and that's who he's referring to when he refers to them as brood of vipers. Um, again, this is John's ability to kind of go forth and, and really be more or less brutally honest, so to speak. Uh, he doesn't take his job lightly, and he speaks the truth. Um, so think about this. If John had been politically correct and catered to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, then would his, would his message have been as strong? Um, I don't think it would have been. I think if he had stroked their ego, then that doesn't really reinforce the fact that he was there preaching that there was a coming Messiah, uh, and he didn't want to be involved with that, um, so to speak. So he made sure to always speak the truth whenever he spoke. Um, In Matthew chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 7 through 10. And this is kind of what we just talked about. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not th think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So here we have John referring to Christ, and he's very much so setting apart himself from the coming Messiah. Uh, he basically says that he's not worthy to wear his sandals, um, but he is still preparing that way. And that happened right before he, he baptized Jesus. That was kind of the account there. Um, so, John also recognized that repentance would show up in everyday actions. Luke chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. I'm not going to go over that one, but he gave practical tips so that people would, um, specifically arguing, targeting areas of their weakness. Uh, and he's basically saying it's kind of along the same lines we had here in Matthew, that if they're not able to produce fruit, then there's, they should be cut down. Uh, when he's referring to trees, that's what he's referring to. John was very humble. Uh, I think that's an important thing for us to remember. In John chapter 3 and verse 30, it says, He must increase, but I must decrease. And what he's referring to there is there are people that are coming to him and they're asking him if he's the Messiah. And John is, is basically saying no, and he always refers back to um, Jesus. One thing about John is at that point in time, you got to remember, he had a lot of people following him because Jesus had not yet started his ministry and was going to begin it soon. So all the people that he had following him, there's, there's one account, and I don't remember where it was because I read a lot of this today, but um, I don't remember if it was in John or Matthew, but he has this group following him, and someone asked him, there, Jesus has begun his ministry at this time, and people are also flocking to Jesus, and it's taking away from John's numbers. And one of his followers asked him about that, and John never considered that to be a problem. Uh, if you think about people that are leaders in, in any way, shape, form, or fashion, 
a lot of times what they're going to say is if they have people that are following them that start falling away and going towards some other leader, they're going to get upset by that. They're going to try and, and really buckle down, so to speak, um, to try and get those people to stay with them. John wasn't like that. John was okay with people flocking to Jesus. He understood Jesus' importance. He also understood his role in the coming Messiah's uh, ministry. So, um, again, we just talked about that he was unfit to, to fit Jesus' sandal. Again, that goes back to his humility. Um, so, as John is going through his ministry, uh, he, he catches uh, Herod's attention, so to speak. Um, let's look at Matthew chapter 14. And I'm going to begin in verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore these powers are at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore he promised an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head or here on a platter. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, because of the oaths and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Then the disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Um, so when he's referring to, he's talking to Herod, and, and Herod had been engaging in some uh, less than desirable activities with his his brother's family, uh, and John told him he couldn't do that. It was wrong. And Herod didn't appreciate that, but at the same time, there's, there seems to be a level of respect, because in there it says that the king was sorry. He was sorry that he had to behead John. Uh, I think that he looked at John as a good person. He looked at John as someone who was a prophet, um, but he wound up putting him to death because he gave this oath to his niece, essentially and said that he was going to have him, or she wanted to have him killed, so he went ahead and put him to death. Um, again, this goes back to John speaking out, being very bold in what he did and, and how he, he preached to people. It was very dangerous for him to take on that role and to take on that stance to stand up against Herod. Uh, Herod had a lot of power, and he not only stood up to him, but he stood up to him and told him he was wrong in what he was doing. Um, so he spoke the truth, and he didn't sugarcoat it, just like he didn't when he called the Pharisees and Sadducees brood of vipers. And it wound up costing him his life. Um, again, he had publicly, re publicly rebuked Herod for his relationship. And uh, once he's put to death, um, it shows that, that, again, he never gave up in the way that he preached and spoke the truth. So what can we take from John's life? So just a few points here. Um, no matter how impossible something seems, from man's standpoint, it's never impossible with God. Look back to the birth of John the Baptist. I mean, at that point when his parents were much older, they were beyond child, childbearing years, or his mother was, and at the same time, they prayed to God every day. Zachariah and Elizabeth prayed every day to have a child. They couldn't do it physically, but God made it happen. Um, so... No matter how impossible something seems, it's never impossible to God. We always remember that. Second point, never doubt God. Uh, Zechariah did. He doubted the word that he was given there when Gabriel came to talk to him, and he was mute because of it. But we don't ever, ever want to place ourselves above God's word. Um, we can't decide whether or not something that we may deem impossible is not something that God's going to see as impossible. So we never need to have that doubt in God. Third thing, uh, just because we're in a Christian family doesn't necessarily save you. So again, going back to some of the scripture here, um, you know, John was born into a life where he would have been a very, he was in the line of priests. Um, he lived a very righteous life. He wound up dying for that. But he also wanted to make the point that in his humility, that he was never greater than Jesus. 
I think that's something that we need to keep in mind too, is that you know, we've got to still do what we're supposed to do to be able to get saved. Uh, always speak the truth. That's another lesson we can take from John. John always did that. He did it sometimes to his detriment uh, because of the way people looked at it and, and viewed what he was saying. They didn't really appreciate what he had to say. And again, like I said earlier, it wound up costing his life. Um, understand that a simple life of devotion to God is joyful. That's something that John did. He didn't live an extravagant lifestyle. He lived very meagerly. He lived in the wilderness. But he dedicated his life to preaching like he was going to do and preaching the coming of the Messiah and setting that ground rule for Jesus to come. Um, it's something that I think, I know I have maybe a hard time with that because you get so used to living a certain way and you think about all these different things that can make you happy. If I had this or if I did that or if I was working here, you may think about those along those lines and say that can make me happy. But really, our simple devotion to the Lord should be enough for us to be joyful. We should be happy that we're following God and that we can understand that we have a chance to be in heaven with him one day once our life is over. Um, we should also examine our lives, see if we have fruit or not. Uh, again, going back to the scripture, John said the ax was at the bottom of the tree ready to chop it if it was not fruitful. We need to be fruitful in everything that we do whenever we're out there and, and talking to people and, and trying to spread those seeds. Uh, we need to always try to do that and make sure that we're as fruitful as we can be as Christians. Um, humility, another big point from John. So whatever ministry we do for the Lord or however we do it, we need to do it um, humbly. Uh, that's something that I think is, is uh, easier said than done. It's not always easy to be humble or practice humility. Uh, John lived a life doing that because he very easily could have said, you know, I'm this person, I'm this great speaker, I'm this great prophet, I've got all these people following me. He never did that. John made sure to stay on the right path and continue to be humble and always put Jesus first and what Jesus' ministry was first and then what John's role was to play in that. Um, so we're going to wrap up about three minutes early. Uh, I hope that made sense. It was kind of a different take than what I've done before. I think that John the Baptist, there's, there's, while there's not a lot written about him, there's a lot we can take from his life. And, and I think that he's an important character and one that we really need to look at because of, of his role that he played in Jesus' ministry and the fact that he was so humble in the way that he did. He's just a great example for us to live by. Um, but again, I, I thank you for your time.